thank, and I, I do want to thank my colleagues, uh, representatives, and senator for coming today. Um, we are partners down at the state legislature together, and as uh, Senator Miller knows, and Setzler and Morgan and everyone else, it, it, it's not an easy thing taking on public education reform uh, in Georgia. But we have uh, worked together for years, and uh, we are. I'm here today because of these folks uh, working with me on some of these issues. Um, you know, talk about public education reform is like a cheap dress. I can say that since I'm a female. Um, <laughs> adding lace around the hem and pressing with starch won't turn it into couture. And likewise, um, gussying up public education won't make it <coughs> but <coughs> change will. Nationally, Georgia ranks near the bottom of the heap in average SAT rankings, standardized tests, and with its uh, newly configured 67% graduation rate within four years. Fran, you were right. It was going to drop significantly. Um, in the last 10 years, though, beginning with uh, Governor Purdue, and actually even preceding that with Governor Barnes, the relative graduation rate has rate increased by 10%. It just was a heck of a lot lower than we thought it was uh, under the new measurements. And it was in no small part because the state, 180 school systems, and 160,000 teachers began focusing closely on whether or not students, and specifically categories of students, were actually learning reading, math, science, and social studies. Additionally, the state created a more challenging curriculum in core subjects. Prior to 2000, I did a little history research, the state mandated student testing, but the results just simply made nice dust catchers on a shelf somewhere. The concept of making adequate progress did not really exist in Georgia. The statewide curriculum, we remember that, was a mile wide and an inch deep and students were not required to pass any kind of standardized test in high school as a condition of graduation. We all remember the era when you would read about or hear about a young man or young woman who had uh, graduated from high school but couldn't even read at the third grade level. You don't hear about those stories in Georgia as much anymore. The first 10 percentage points, though, were relatively easy because we had nowhere to go but out. The next 10 percentage points in the graduation rate will be far more difficult. And more of the same isn't going to get us there. You know, I, I listened down in the education committee. I've sat there for 10 years, uh, most of the time with Morgan and Miller and Setzler. And, um, you know, we hear spend more, expect more, test more, utilize more technology, give more local <coughs> control to school systems. Um, I feel like that uh, SNL movie or show where you know he would talk about a band down by the river and I uh, think local control uh, every time. But uh, and, and I always hear provide systems with more flexibility and more so-called accountability. You know I thought about this and and I can't even use the word accountability anymore with respect to public education because to the average person. Accountability means consequences. Students are held accountable when they fail a test, when they don't earn a high school diploma, when they fail a course. On the other hand, accountability at the school system level has become meaningless. There are no meaningful consequences for failure to meet state goals or requirements. Try this. On your, de on your tables, you'll see a, a document that I printed. I put it on the desk of the House of Representatives the day before the last day of session. It lists every school system in Georgia and how they spend money as they report it to the state. These are their numbers, not mine. And uh, the first, I sorted it, just to give you a couple of kind of interesting data, today, by how much each school system spends per student on central admin. I think it's listed there as general admin. There's another sheet on your uh, table that shows what's in each category. Well, general admin isn't teachers, it's not curriculum specialists, it's not librarians, it's not janitors, it's not counselors, it's superintendents, 
central office, school board members, and everything that's over there in central office. Where's the accountability when a city of Atlanta spends almost $3,000 per student on central admin? Where's the accountability when 21%, I put the graduation rates on there as well under the new, uh, the new formula, 21% of Georgia high schools have a graduation rate below 50%. I don't know of a single superintendent who's been fired over that. Imagine a, mon mon a monopolistic industry <laughs> resisting today's fierce global economy by demanding more subsidies and protection and offering to deliver more of the same. Well, that describes public education reform by the education establishment in Georgia today. But change is not an option with an increasingly challenging student population to educate and fewer well-paying blue-collar jobs awaiting dropouts. Injecting more tax dollars alone won't move the achievement needle. I will say as an aside though, when you look at these numbers, you will see vast disparity in the numbers and, uh, the, and the dollars that are there to support students from a Tolliver County to a city of Atlanta. We do have, I believe, unacceptable disparities in the monies that we have available to educate children. Uh, but Georgia does rank first among 14 southeastern states in teacher pay and benefits. We spend more per student on public education and as a percentage of our state budget than all of those states. But Zig Ziglar had it right when he said, if you keep on doing what you're doing, you'll keep on getting what you're getting. And, you know, we have to ask, how can we do public education differently to spur economic development and change lives? Well, I could go on and well exceed my 15 minutes with uh, a many-layered discussion on what we can do, some of which uh, Fran Miller has championed uh, in the education that, that is making a difference and will make a difference. But it's going to take a mini multi-pronged approach. I do believe we have to give parents more options. You know, my children, all four of them, attended the traditional big public school. It was our attendance zone. We were happy. It was the right decision for our family. But it is not the right decision for every family. All students are different. And having what I call public schools of choice, independent <coughs> charter schools, gives parents different options. And I think we are bound to offer in the 21st century parents different uh, options. Did a little looking. I was visiting my parents this weekend. My parents are getting elderly. And I thought, how has education changed in my father's lifetime? Well, he was born in 1933. In the early 30s, one half of the state budget revenues derived from motor fuel and vehicle license taxes. The state sales tax didn't exist. Today, one third of our state sale or state revenues come from the state sales tax, and motor fuel taxes constitute 6%. Back then, when my father was born, 30% of Georgia's state revenue uh, budget was devoted to education. Today, it's half. Then. Two-thirds of Georgians worked in agriculture, primarily growing cotton, <coughs> corn, and tobacco. Today, federal, state, and local governments employ more citizens than any other sector in Georgia, followed by retail. <coughs> then, Georgia spent less than $35 per student on education. When adjusted by the CPI inflation rate, that spending then, today, would equal $458 per student. Today, state, federal, and local spending is, is on that document on your desk, averages $10,866 per Georgia student, including capital construction expenditures. Then, early 30s, there were 700,000 students and 21,000 st uh, teachers. Today, the number of students have doubled the number of teachers has grown by fivefold. The school term lasted from three to seven, three to nine months when my father was born. In 1937, a minimum seven-month term was enacted. Uh, what mattered in the 30s was not the graduation rate, but just a basic literacy rate. That's how uh, states and schools were measured, if they were measured at all. In fact, only 10% actually attended 11th grade when my father was born, which was as far as high school went. Today, 67% of students graduate within four years. 
of course, more eventually graduate or obtain a GED, and, but still our graduation rate compares very poorly with the rest of the nation. When my father was five, the state legislature created a state salary <coughs> schedule for teachers uh, and began requiring free textbooks. The legislature created the teacher's <coughs> retirement program when he was 10 years old. And here's my point. What will my grandchildren say? or your grandchildren say when they look back and they compare public education today in 2012 with public education tomorrow. Will they say that public education in Georgia looks like it does today or that it has evolved to meet tomorrow's demands and needs? The information age and the global economy have shrunk the world. Georgia's children and grandchildren attending Tolliver County Schools are and will compete not just with the 198 other students in the entire Tolliver County School Board system, elementary, middle, and high. They will compete with students all over the United States and all over the world. And we have to have <coughs> options and opportunities that cannot simply be pigeonholed by geography and into attendance lines. Our priority has to be assuring that these students have options and opportunities, not protecting the status quo. In that regard, uh, Georgia will vote on a constitutional amendment on November 6th that the other members of the legislature here were um, instrumental in helping pass. Um, briefly, why do we need this constitutional amendment? Many of you are familiar, uh, you know, exactly almost one year ago, the Supreme Court in fourth year decision um, jeopardized Georgia's ability to establish statewide K-12 public education policy. When I described education uh, 80 years ago, you can see the state has had a very strong role in bringing us along to what we are. We do, in fact, have a state brand to protect. Secondarily, and actually less importantly, uh, the Supreme Court narrowed the state's general ability to authorize public charter schools. That's the one that gets all the attention, but it's really much deeper than just the charter school issue. It's whether or not we can enact general policies and protect our state brand. Without a constitutional amendment, uh, many of the laws that parents and teachers rely on could be subject to legal challenge, as was pointed out in the Supreme Court's minority opinion by the Attorney General and the legislature's education attorney. The broad court opinion explicitly stated that school boards have exclusive control over public K-12 education. For emphasis, the opinion restated that local boards have exclusive control six separate times in the opinion, even though the word exclusive does not appear in the Constitution. You know, most people agree that local boards of education play a critical role in public education. But most people also agree that local boards of education should not have exclusive control over public education. That decision deviated sharply from the state's historically significant role in public education, including funding half its costs today, imposing class size restrictions, establishing graduation requirements to statewide curriculum, <coughs> providing a teacher pay scale and retirement system. Businesses, uh, the chamber members here know, uh, considering relocating to Georgia place a top priority, number one priority on an educated workforce above transportation, tax system, and all other measures that they evaluate a location by. And that's why the Georgia Chamber placed the constitutional amendment as a high priority. You know, I get the question all the time, and I'm probably preaching to the choir, why do we need another authorizer? Well, most states are moving in this direction, and we know that without an alternate authorizer, you just don't really have public schools of choice. Um, in Georgia, particularly in 2007, local boards of education denied every single startup charter uh, school application. 2008, when we worked heavily with uh, Fran Miller and we passed a previous uh, charter school bill that was struck down, 25 of 27 applications were turned down by local boards of education. Today, after 10 years of growth in the charter school movement, less than 2% of Georgia's children have access to a charter school. 
you know, charter schools just don't fit within most attendance lines. They cross over geography. A, a Georgia Research University has talked to me and they've expressed interest in partnering with a, uh, a charter school, with its school of education, to serve students across a broad geographical area. This is not possible without state authorization. I'd like to give you an example, though, um, of why some folks like status quo and why I think it is, it is truly uh, a problem for us moving forward. The Georgia School Board Association and the Georgia Superintendents Association have declared war on the upcoming constitutional amendment, giving parents more decision making through independent charter schools. Which is a shame, because when you look at the uh, printout on your, on your table, you can see there are many other bigger issues that they should be concerned about in getting their houses in order and making sure that students uh, learn. Let me give you a recent example of the Georgia School Board Association's narrow definition of local control and how it is not always in the best interest of students and teachers. You may have read the AJC article last week with the headline, Gwinnett Schools to Furlough Teachers Again and Increase Class Sizes. The Gwinnett County School System enrolls 160,000 students, or 10% of Georgia's public education students in Georgia. The article said that these two efforts, uh, furloughing teachers and increasing class sizes, <coughs> saved the district $43 million by eliminating two days of pay for teachers and increasing class sizes by two students. Additionally, the article went on to say, the system will save $7.8 million by eliminating teacher raises based on training and experience, raises that we as legislators put in the budget specifically for teachers. About 60% of all teachers qualify for a t and &E raise each year, it's 3%. These three measures together, furloughing teachers, which is another way of saying cutting their pay, uh, increasing class sizes, it's another way of saying eliminating teacher slots, and number three, not giving them the raise that we thought they should get for T&E, um, they uh, all will call, come up to a $51 million savings. So put that over here, $51 million. Well, I'd like to offer another option, one that puts students and teachers first. If Gwinnett's superintendent, Alvin Wilbanks, and its school board really want to support teachers and students, how about cutting central office spending to the state average? <coughs> when you look on your form, and I did it, you'll see they rank in the top 20% of central office spending per student in the state, although they can achieve the greatest economies of scale by having 10% 10 per, uh, 10 of the state's students in their school system. Even better, we're in COP today, and COP does a very good job with its low spending on central office. How about if Gwinnett County slashes its central office spending to the Cobb County average, since large school systems can achieve economies of scale that you will see our smallest school systems really cannot. If Gwinnett would trim its massive spending on central office, $579 per student to Cobb County's $228 per student, less than half. It could afford to reduce class sizes by two students, eliminate the two-day teacher furlough, and pay the $7.8 million to teachers that have earned training and experience increases. There are things that can be changed that have nothing to do with fighting giving parents options, needed options, to help them prepare them for the 21st century. Our state's future is inextricably linked and connected to our ability to move public education into the 21st century so that it meets the needs of our students and an educated workforce. Georgia needs a partnership among school boards, teachers, parents and the state in the upcoming constitutional amendment for the sheriff.
Thank you, Jan. Um, when I got the invitation to speak alongside our speaker pro tem, I felt quite honored. And uh, you can see why. She's a very smart woman who knows her stuff. And I also made her go first because I knew that she would do a good job of setting the foundation and really setting the tone and helping us to understand where we are as a state. And then I would come behind her and do uh, all that I know how to do, which is to uh, set the stage on what we're dealing with from a political, from a personal, uh, <coughs> from a perspective that I think too often we don't get to hear uh, in these kinds of rooms, in these kinds of circles, where we are speaking to the choir. It's nice to walk into a room where I don't have to explain what a charter school is. I don't have to qualify why a charter school is a public school. I don't have to talk about why it's important that we put kids first, but instead can have a different kind of conversation about what's happening in the state. And so there are three things that I want to talk about this morning. Number one, our need to raise expectations in education. And when I talk about raising expectations, I think about where we are. We're in Cobb County, and those of you who don't live here, welcome. Please make sure you go to the mall when you leave here and spend lots of money. But I think about a couple of conversations that I've had recently with educators in Cobb County. One, that John Carson was in the room uh, just a couple of days ago. It was a teacher from one of the schools in my district, and she gave probably a 10-minute speech of her own, which was supposed to be a question. But she talked about the challenges that she faces as a teacher, and I know her and I have great respect for her, but I, I was upset with the comments that she made because what she said was if she were to give a lesson at the school that she's in, all the kids would fail. But if she would take the same lesson to kids in East Cobb, every one of them would pass. And I wondered for a moment if she realized what she was saying, not just about the kids in her own school, but even her own teaching ability. And I wondered if she realized the impression that she was <coughs> leaving on this room of people who had probably never stepped foot in the school that she described. And it made me think about another conversation that I have with principals in my district. I meet with them on a regular basis and talk to them about what's happening at the state level and hear from them about what they think needs to happen in education. And I remember a meeting that we had last year when the principals agreed that they're doing the best they can with the students that they have. And I thought, if that is the attitude that you are going into the schools with, that's the attitude in which you hire teachers, that's the attitude in which you treat parents, that is the attitude in which you decide how much the kids that I serve, the kids who live in my neighborhood and go to my church, the kind of education they deserve. And so there's a problem with the level of expectations that we have in our schools. And what I know is that when I work with students who participate in my leadership program, and I've worked with over 50 students over the last four years, I am amazed at their intelligence, the questions that they ask, their abilities to put things together and to understand concepts and to know what's going on around them. And then I question what is going on between what the students believe and are seeing and those teachers and some, some of the teachers and some of the principals that I encounter in the schools. There's a problem with the level of expectation. And so yes, as the teacher was talking about the other day, there is a level of expectation that we ought to have for parents. Because the point that she was making was the parents just aren't involved. But if I had a longer time to talk to her, I would ask her, how welcoming is the school when parents come? Do they use acronyms that parents don't understand? Because as you know, in education, they change about every two or three years. And so how comfortable do parents feel when they walk into a school? When we talk about parent engagement, what does that even mean? Because if I went around this room, we'd all have 50 different definitions of what parent engagement even is. But somehow we have this level of expectation that because you live in a particular neighborhood, because you make a certain amount of money, that this is the expectation that we're supposed to have. And when you don't meet that, then there's something wrong with you. 
And when we talk about education, we rarely talk about that the problem is with adults, but we like to blame kids because it's their fault. And so we have to fix our expectations and we have to expect more from our kids, but more importantly, more from the adults who work with them, who say that we care about kids and we say that we but we believe that we're doing the best we can for who we are working with. I'm reminded of the Office of Student, excuse me, the Office of Civil Rights report that was just released recently from the U.S. Department of Education. Again, I'm still talking about expectations. In schools that are predominant African American and Hispanic, they are less likely to be assigned they are more likely, excuse me, twice as likely to be assigned newer teachers in the profession. And so think about the policies that are in place, and I'm not suggesting that this is racially motivated. What I'm saying is if you have policies in place where you are putting newer and less experienced teachers in areas that have higher need, how do you expect those students to rise to the level of our expectations? When we talk about access, and we know that there's a large focus right now on math and science, and there ought to be. There's an indication in the report that the, uh, the Office of Civil Rights report put out. It says there's a disparity in higher level math and science courses. 82% of schools in diverse districts serving the fewest Hispanic and African American students offer Algebra 2. 82% of those schools. However, 65% of those schools servicing predominantly Hispanic and African American students do not offer the same course. Talking about expectations. In schools that do offer high level courses, Hispanics make up 20% of the population, but 10% take the course like calculus or advanced science. And so the key to preparing students to be successful upon graduation is early access of mastery in algebra. To date, on a quarter of, a quarter of students take, a, take algebra in seventh and eighth grades, 86% of white students take these courses in middle school and pass, as did 79% of Hispanic and African American students. White students are still the majority when it comes to access to early algebra courses. There needs to be more emphasis on getting Hispanic and African American students in math courses earlier, and getting them access to advanced courses throughout their high school careers. And so again, if we have policies in place that don't have high expectations, that do not provide access to all students, what are we saying about ourselves? What are we saying about our school system? What are we saying about what we believe in all students and their ability to learn? And so secondly, I want to talk about the need for us to engender trust. And now this comes the political discussion, which is going to make some of you uncomfortable, I guarantee it. <laughs> but people often ask, you know, how is it that even in this room, I'm the only black Democrat here from the legislature? Probably because most of my colleagues don't even know that this exists and they just don't know. But there's a real disconnect between those of us who get it and understand the need to reform education and those of us who understand the need but don't get it. And so what am I saying? I'm saying that in the discussion of 1162, I had several of my colleagues in the Democratic caucus who came and said, I'm with you, Alicia, but I can't do it because the teachers union is threatening to primary me. Or Alicia, I can't do it because charters is the slippery slope to vouchers. And it's not so much that, it's not just the politics, but it's <coughs> folks in South Georgia who know what it's like to have the segregation academy. And so I don't understand that. I'm 33. Mm -hmm. I don't have that life experience. But my colleagues, some of them who are much older than I am, have that experience. And so there is a disconnect about what they see in their past and what they believe is repeating itself. And then the people who are the messengers of education reform. And I'm not going to get into issues because I don't, I, I want to keep you my friends. <laughs> so I don't need to talk about some of the other things. But the point that I want to make is the messenger often is more important than the message itself. And so if you don't have people who look like them, 
who understand their experience, who aren't pushing other policies that have nothing to do with education, but what they see is opposite of what they believe in, then it's difficult to trust legislators, it's difficult to trust other groups who may be advocating for policies. And so we've got to get to a place, those of us who get it, who understand, that we've got to diversify this room, that we need to diversify this conversation. That we need to understand that when Sharon Beasley T gets up and talks at the well about how charter schools are gonna take us back to slavery, I think it's the craziest thing in the world. <laughs> but in her experience, there's something that she's lived through that has said this, this could be a reality. And so I was mad and angry and frustrated and laughed a little bit. But I also know that I have to take the time to have a conversation with her. And I need to take her down to Ivy Prep Academy and show her those beautiful black girls, many of them, who look like her, whose experience she probably understands. They look like her grandchildren and her nieces and the people in her family. And help those children express to her the educational experience that they are getting. We've got to engender trust to say that it's not just about Republicans carrying this message or carrying this set of policies, but it's got to be a bipartisan effort. And I want to take the moment to acknowledge Representative Jones because 1162 was difficult. And we had a lot, a lot of difficult moments this session. And I can tell you we sat in a couple of meetings and she will tell you that I said, listen, I'm with you, but I need to know that I can trust you and that we're going to talk and we're going to communicate and know there will be no surprises. And she gave me her word and that is exactly what happened. We talked more this session than I think the 10 years that we've served together. But I was proud to stand with her because I knew that she had my back and she knew that I had hers. That is what we need more of if we are going to reform this system. That it can't just be Republicans standing up with all the good education policy. That you can't have meetings and, and make decisions without other folks sitting at the table. Because when I go home and talk to the teachers and the principals, and I look at the gaping hole of the achievement gap in Cobb County, that's a reality. I don't get to go back home and just think about other things, but every day when my husband and I work, wake up in the morning, we're thinking about what more can we do to change the system? How can we ensure that the parents who call us, that we have dinner with, that come to us at church, have access to a quality education and have the option that they so desire? Because the truth is everybody in this room, you would not send your child to a school that doesn't work for them. And we're all blessed that we have the means to send them or to move to places where schools will properly serve our kids. But what about those that don't? And those Democrats who we sometimes get mad, and I think I get more mad than any of you in this room, trust me, they're living a real experience where they too have to look at parents who are tired of sending their kids to schools that don't work for them but they have to know that what we are espousing and what we are pushing will in fact work for them. I also want to say that what we set with 1162 and the bipartisan support that we had and the bipartisan opposition, that it really was a model for how we need to set education policy from here on out. And so I'm asking each of you to help us ensure that we remain bipartisan in our efforts to improve education in the state. And then finally, I want to talk about embracing change. Insanity is doing the same thing the same way and expecting different results. And that's what's going on with our education system. We have the same education system that we've had for 50 years with drastically different kids with drastically different needs, desires, and wants. But somehow we think that if we just keep doing the same thing, it's going to work. Maybe not in this room, but I think that is the prevailing thought. And so we have to change the makeup of the policy-making bodies. 
yeah, we need some more school board members who you don't have to understand why, you don't have to explain to them why Teach for America is a good idea. That's what's happening in Cobb County right now. My husband who's on the school board was trying to get Teach for America uh, to have a bigger contract in Cobb County. It wasn't going to cost the district one dollar. And it failed because of the lack of support and the lack of understanding, the unwillingness to change, to do something different. And it wasn't until about two weeks ago that the board even looked at the disparities and the achievement gaps in Cobb County. And so how is it that you can serve on a board but you don't understand where we are in terms of student achievement? What could be more important? And so in Cobb County, we do things very well, that is true. But just like Cobb and Gwinnett and many other places, there are some deep, dark, dark secrets that we don't talk about. The kids that don't get served, the ones that don't make it to the numbers, that are hiding, that we, don't, we are not adequately serving. And so if we are going to do something different, we've got to change our mindsets, change the makeup of our policy-making bodies, and change, yes, even in the legislature. And as I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about politics. I'm going to say this about change. I got a call, two calls yesterday from Democratic colleagues who are concerned because they've been primaried. And I'm one of them. I have two primary opponents that were recruited by the teachers union. And one, both of them showed up at my town hall meeting last week, and one of them boldly introduced herself as my opponent and proudly acknowledged that she was recruited by the teachers union. And so some of you, I'm going to be calling for a check. <laughs> See, you were. <laughs> and I'm telling you that as a warning, but I'm also letting you know that some of you won't write me a check because you're a Republican and you don't want to be seen given to Democrats. And so what I'm saying is that we've got to change the way we do things. Because kids are not Democrats or Republicans, they're just kids who deserve a quality education. And if I and many others, and it's not about me, but there are several Democrats who have stood with us on 1162 who took a lot more darts than I did. Because I'm used to it, it's been a couple years, I'm okay. But there are Democrats who were in tears, some who didn't know if they would come back because they thought they might get beat, and it's possible. But they had the courage to stand up for kids. And so what I'm asking is that you will stand up with them. And so if they call, or even if they don't call, and you know a good Democrat, even if it's just on this one issue, send them a check. Give them some support. Pick up the phone and call them and thank them for their courage. Because we have to change the way we do things. This issue is not about politics. It's not about who's going to end up on my disclosure report and then I won't be able to run for something later. But if we really believe in what we're saying, then our actions have to follow that. We have to do those things. We cannot continue to do business the same way. And we, we criticize the school system and we criticize those who are in the status quo for doing things the same way. But when it comes to us, we want to do things the same way. And so I'm challenging you to think differently about how we support candidates and how we get the right people in office and who it is that we support publicly and privately. I will close by saying this. There's a great, a great quote by Gandhi that says that we must become the change that we wish to see. And so not all of you serve in the legislature, but all of you have a role to play. And if you believe what I believe, that every child can learn, and that we must have high expectations, and that we can have a state that is economically strong and well-educated, and if we believe that no matter the zip code, no matter the parent's pedigree or how many degrees they have, but they should have an opportunity to learn, then we have the ability to change how we do business in education and how we see ourselves and the roles that we play. We have the ability to do things that have never been done before, not because we're all the same, but because we believe in the same thing. And that is those children who we stand up at the well for, who we go to work and advocate for, 
that brought us here at 7.30 in the morning. And so we must have high expectations, not just for our children, but for our parents, for our school systems, for our entire education system. And we must have high expectations for ourselves. We must engender trust, because maybe we won't agree on every single issue, but on this one, we can come together. But we've got to trust each other, and we've got to have each other's back. And thirdly, we have to embrace change, and we know that it's difficult. But because our children deserve it, our state deserves it, we have no other choice. And so I leave you with my favorite quote. It's by Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. It says that every person is born into this world to do something distinctive and something unique. And if he or she does not do it, it will never be done. What brings us to this room together is the work that we do. And it's not because we are all well paid, some of you are, some of us legislators are not. <laughs> but it's the calling that brings us here. It's those children who deserve better, who deserve to have high expectations. And remember, as Dr. Mays has said, that if we don't do it, it will never be done. Thank you. Representatives, uh, we've got time for a few questions. You all can come on up and, and take a question too. Who's got a question? Ernest? We're going to pass the uh, bill in November. With your help. <laughs> it's going to be a challenge. Uh, there, uh, I, I've been stunned about every single day. I get a call from one or two of my colleagues to uh, talk about a retired teachers group or the Cherokee County just their school board just took a vote which surprised me if every school board in Georgia does that uh, they're scaremongering the teachers you know what what they're not telling the teachers is public charter schools employ public teachers who also have access in fact by law are required to participate in the teacher's retirement system and have access and in fact receive teachers' health or state health benefits. But they're scaring teachers, uh, many of whom who you know, would also like the options for their children. But uh, it is going to be a challenge. I'm hopeful that we will. It's the first time we can find in the U.S. that there's been a constitutional amendment on the ballot for charter schools. So it's critically important that we do this not just for Georgia, but for the rest of the nation. And I'll just say, um, from a strategic point of view, we're going to have to have some really cool coalitions out there. And I know that um, we have some uh, that are those that helped pass 1162 in the legislature, but in that same coalition, Better Georgia, as I was saying. Uh, brighter Georgia. Brighter Georgia. Education Coalition. Thank you, that one. Um, so those of you who are interested in helping, I hope that you'll talk to Mark, talk to Tony Roberts, and be a part of that coalition. But we're going to need all boots on the ground, you know, financial support for the campaign, but also people out there talking in their churches and, you know, in your rotary clubs and everywhere else. Because people just, if you don't know what a charter school is, if you've only heard what the retired teacher has said, you may not be familiar with what it is that we're trying to do. And we've got to combat some of the things that are already happening out there, anti-charter school rallies and things like that. So we got to run a very positive campaign. I think that will be, that, that is kid-centered, and I think that will be okay if we get out there and do that. It, it does poll well, I will say. We did some polling ahead of time and looking at the question. And uh, you know, on the face of it, it polls well. The concern I have is, um, I just, I, I'm a former PTA queen. I mean, I, I was that person. I thought being very involved as a PTA queen meant supporting my school and the students who went there. I didn't realize there's a national agenda that is very anti-school um, choice. And um, they uh, have boots on the ground with book bags going home every day, even though that uh, actually is against the law. But uh, it would not surprise me if they use it. Jenny? I wanted to ask, um, you said that 
that the superintendents and school boards are wedging war mm -hmm. on this, and I'm, I'm sure they are. I saw them start it down at the Capitol. Um, do you have any idea what kind of money they plan to spend uh, to defeat? I, I do not, but I know that they are uh, actively, if not, have already engaged a campaign consultant. And um, the only the history I could find of a referendum it was not a constitutional amendment, it was a voter initiative referendum, it was in Washington State, it lost a few years ago. Uh, there were some differences in that Washington State does not have any charter schools. No one even knows what that beast is in Washington. They don't even have locally approved charter schools. It was also a voter initiative in which they wrote the question. In this one, we wrote the question. It's not a bad question. Um, and so, uh, but they, uh, so I do not know how much money they will uh, put into it. I will say <coughs> Georgia, GAE, Georgia Association of Educators, did not formally <coughs> oppose the bill. I worked with Tracy Ann, and uh, she's actually invited me to come meet with some teachers' groups. So I, uh, I don't know what role they will take, but uh, I don't find that when you sit down and talk to a teacher, most teachers, uh, you get beyond the scaremongering, now, this is not anti-teachers. Uh, nothing uh, influences the achievement of a student more than parental influence on a teacher. Uh, it is, though, the School Board Association, Superintendents Association, do see it as direct competition. I guess you could say it is. Speaking of the acronyms, uh, we got one question asking, what is 1162 we're referring yeah. to? So 1162 <laughs> was House Resolution uh, 1162, was the constitutional amendment that would allow the ballot uh, on the um, uh, you know, on November 6th, and it required a two-thirds vote. It took two votes in the House, two votes in the Senate to get it over the edge, but that's pretty stunning when you think that we got a two-thirds majority in both houses, and close to 30 percent of the Democrat caucus voted for it. I'd say another 20 percent wanted to, and just didn't feel like um, that they could politically because of the election <laughs> year, uh, I'd say at least 20% more uh, supported it. There was definitely bipartisan support of the concept. Yeah. Uh, a question for you. I, I've been talking with, with Mark and, and Tony and, and you, Kelly, about the fact that we need to broaden the dialogue, particularly what's coming out of the mainstream media, because it, it, it's, it seems very apparent, especially in the metro Atlanta area, that we're getting a one-sided view to, to the electorate um, on this particular issue, in fact, in education reform in general. How do we get a yang in for the yin that's already in there? It's difficult. They buy the ink. Uh, you know, they, the, the newspapers, I mean, when, every time I read Morgan Downey, every time I read Dick Yarborough, um, you know, they are either employed by the newspapers or contracted with them. For us, it's, it's responding. I remember I wrote an editorial on 1162 after two or three editorials, including one scathing one by Ann Downey, who sent uh, her children to Hidea. At least I set mine to public school. Anyway, they uh, would not even publish the editorial of mine until like a week and a half later. So they have control over that. Uh, we can keep trying. You know, we need um, voices like Alicia's and, and Ron Mayo's and others that uh, can demonstrate that this is not just a. Um, you know, it, just, it stuns me when in Georgia they're they're portraying it as a Republican thing. Of course, you know, mainstream press hates us. It's not. You look nationally, Illinois, 65% of their legislature is Democrat. They passed the charter school bill that we passed four years ago last year. Only four legislators voted against it in the House. It, this is not a, a, you know, you go to a Democrat state majority and they're doing things like this. You go to a Republican state, they are, it, it truly does transcend uh, partisan politics. But uh, for some reason here in Georgia, uh, the mainstream uh, media has decided that this is anti-teachers, anti-Democrat, and it's just simply not the case.
We have time for two more questions. I'll go over this side of the room. Susan? Alicia, since this breakfast is about choice, would you please talk about the status of your um, school choice legislation that passed about two years ago to give public school choice to children within their school district, how that's working out, and um, if there's any resistance at the local level, and what that says about school board and school systems, and how that votes for the future of this referendum? Interesting. Um, I hadn't thought about it in terms of uh, the country. Oh, her question was about uh, House Bill 251, which was passed in 2009, uh, and I authored and I'm very grateful to my friends in the room who helped make that happen. Um, Ed Sutzer is one of the co-sponsors as well. But what it does is it allows for kids uh, to transfer within their public school district. We had at one point where you could transfer outside, but, you know, that's a whole other story. Um, but they can currently, by law, transfer within their school district. Uh, and rather than having to prove hardship or something else that uh, different districts were uh, requiring, it's the only requirement is that the school or the, the class that they want to go in must have space. And so I think it has been a huge success across the state. I hear from parents all of the time. Um, and it, there's nothing better than going to the, I went to the wing shop a couple weeks ago and somebody said, oh, I'm transferring my child at this school and I'm so excited and I was so proud to be able to say, and I'm the sponsor. Um, so parents are very, very excited. There are challenges. At the state level, um, when we passed the law, we wanted for the law to be uniform, but we did not put a lot of rules in place um, in terms of the law itself. We didn't, we didn't lay out every single detail of how it needs to be um, applied. And so that was uh, helpful in terms of getting it passed, but it was harmful in terms of making sure that it worked. And so the, the short version is, uh, and I'll use Cobb County as an example, I just met with my superintendent uh, last week to talk about House Bill 251. Because what's happening in Cobb is that there's supposed to be a lottery conducted if there are more students who want the slot than slots available. They don't conduct it in public. And so they just call the students that got in and that's it. And the other parents don't hear anything. Um, and in some districts, they allow trailers to be used as space, and some that they don't. And in Cobb County, if the school has a trailer, nowhere in the school has space. And so the interpretation and the implementation of the law has been problematic, and so we've got to do some fixing on that. Um, in terms of 1162, and really your question about school boards, they're opposed to change. And so even within their system, these are tax dollars within their system, the same schools, there is even resistance there. Um, I do commend systems like Fayette County, um, Marietta City that have already had those public school options, um, but largely around the state it is problematic. Um, but those parents who are able to take advantage of it are very, very happy. Thanks for that question. I'm gonna ask one last question, and Representative Jones, while we've got your statistics here, would you tell everyone if we approve the, the referendum and we have state chartered schools, how much of that local money listed there is going to follow the child? So um, there's a statistic on there, and it really my point with this is to demonstrate to you how different school systems are throughout Georgia. We have school systems from 199 students in the entire system, 260,000 representing 10 percent of students' children, and so that means that students have very different opportunities, and in many cases, very limited opportunities. With the Constitutional Amendment and then the enabling law, it makes it very clear that none of their locally raised tax dollars would follow the student. That, that is explicitly prohibited in current Constitution and will continue to be. These students would be completely funded at the state level. Now, what I have heard when I'm asked by a school board member, well, you're just going to take it out of our money that comes to us. So, well, you know, I don't know why you presume that any more than you would presume every time we fund in the budget another state patrol car that we're going to take it out of your pocket. Or we fund another criminal to have a, a jail cell that we're going to take it out of your pocket. Um, we spend about $8 billion on public education. If this program became $50 million, that is a small drop in the bucket of our entire $18 billion budget. <coughs> I will say this, though, that I last year we passed a bill and there was provision in it that I frankly did not support. I liked the underlying bill, I voted for the bill, but I've never heard school board members uh, resist this. 
few years ago, uh, we have a thing called dual enrollment, where a child can take classes in a college or technical college, and they can receive dual credit. Um, so that program was sort of growing along. It's sort of that concept of move on when ready, start taking classes. It'll help high achieving students to go ahead and take a class at tech. It'll help students who are at risk of dropping out. They can take a class at a, a perimeter college or technical college. Well, Governor Purdue, I think rightfully so, said, you know what, we're only going to fund these students once. So if you go take, out of your six classes in a day, you take one class at Perimeter College, that money from the state will follow the child. Now, your local tax dollars you'll retain. So in essence, every time a child leaves to go take a dual enrollment class, you're kind of financially to the better because you kept on average half of every dollar being spent on the child. The school boards resisted to the point that our dual enrollment numbers, and Fran's aware of this, started nosediving because they couldn't keep all of the money, even for services not rendered. <laughs> so last year, as a part of a very good underlying bill, we put it back in there that we are now back to double funding. Well, I've yet to have a school board member ask me, oh my gosh, that's taking money that other school systems should earn in the QBE, the Quality Basic Education Formula, because we're double funding. You know, it's only when it's a program they don't like. It's not about the money. We have 13 state-approved charter schools in Georgia. It is a drop in the bucket. What it is, this is a struggle between whether we will have a partnership with the state to enact statewide policies on education. And what is frightening to me as a legislator who will not be here forever, uh, hopefully not even all that long, um, I mean, you know, you serve your time and you move on and you do other things, is that I am extremely concerned a long time that if the state is not financially and whole hog invested in public education because it is a partnership, it will, over time, weaken our commitment as a state to public education. Because if there's no real accountability for those state tax dollars, if we're not on the hook, as we always thought we were, to supply an adequate education, but if we accept the interpretation of the Supreme Court by 4-3 decision, then it is solely a, it is a balkanized public education system comprised of 180 schools <coughs> very differing degrees of competence and performance throughout the state. And that is why that constitutional amendment is so important. But, to, but it will not take one dime of their local property tax dollars. I have to share this, Kelly. I know it's time to go, but I need, to, I need one minute. to. It's one thing I forgot to mention in my comments. Something that we should be proud of is the work that's going on with Race to the Top. And if you're not familiar with that, we got a $400 million grant from the U.S. Department of Education, a nice bipartisan effort with uh, Governor Sonny Perdue and now Governor Nathan Deal and our uh, President Barack Obama and, and his administration. We have $400 million in 25 <coughs> now districts that are participating uh, in these efforts. And so we're doing four things. Number one, we're looking at curriculum and assessments. I mean, we all know, hopefully you know about common core standards that are coming down and being rolled out um, throughout the state, throughout the country. There are many states participating. Um, we've got uh, a focus on making sure we have effective leaders and teachers in every school and classroom. Um, a longitudinal data system that will track students from pre-K all the way through getting their PhD at the University of Georgia and, and allowing that system to inform a teacher's uh, delivery of education for an individual child. And then the fourth one is turning around low-performing schools. And so that's something that we can be proud of as a state, that we are getting the dollars to focus on students and improving wholesale the education system in the state. And so if you're not familiar with that, I would ask you to become familiar and find out if your local school district is participating in that. But it's something that we can be excited about and be proud of, and, and hopefully it will move with a sense of urgency uh, so that every child can benefit from that and will have a system we can be proud of. Please help me thank Representatives Morgan and James. Thank you to the Charter School Association. And, you know, just when you become jaded about politics, you see it's a bipartisan cooperation on an issue like this and passage of things like criminal justice reform and charter school legislation. 
It makes you feel better and that this is how we're going to move forward in Georgia. Thank you all, and we will see you next month.